Today I'm talking about escaping end times deception. With all the deception happening in the world today, how can we know that we won't be deceived? I'm going to show you what Jesus said about that and the answer to that. I'm also talking today about Iran and Russia and Israel with less than a month to go until Iran achieves nuclear capability. The Israeli foreign minister visited Moscow last week and warned them that they are prepared to strike Iran. Huge in the news. And I'm answering your questions. I'm Jimmy Evans. Welcome to the Escaping in Times Deception. Now, let me just say, I never thought that I would live to see a world like the world as it exists right now. I never thought I would see a world where you couldn't say boys and girls. And many of our public school teachers are being told now they cannot call their students boys and girls any longer. They have to find different names for them because of being politically correct. And all the confusion and deception that is in the world today, and that's just one example of end times deception. It is rampant. But how do you know, you know, if you're going to live in truth and not be deceived, I would say that almost everyone deceived thinks they're walking in truth. You know, part of being deceived is you're deceived and you don't know it. And so how do you know that you're walking in truth? How can you know that you're not going to be deceived? Here's what Jesus said in Matthew 24. This is the Olivet Discourse where the disciples are asking Jesus what the end is going to be. It says, Matthew 24, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And obviously that has happened. Many false Christs have come. Many people are in the world today, not just saying that they're Jesus necessarily, but saying that they have the truth and, and you know, inviting people to follow them in their so-called truth, which is actually deception. The first warning Jesus gave in talking about the end was don't be deceived. This is the apostle Paul now in 2 Thessalonians. The coming of the lawless one, that's the Antichrist. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So Paul is saying here, when the end comes, the, when you see the Antichrist about to take the stage, you're going to see Satan coming with all the false power signs and unrighteousness and deception in the world. We're seeing it right now. I mean, I just, I just believe that Jesus is coming soon. I believe the Antichrist will soon come to power because the spirit of the Antichrist is everywhere. And so it says they did not uh, receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. Your relationship with the word is what either sets you up for deception or keeps you from being deceived. They did not receive the love of the truth. The word love there is agape. And we know that the word agape is the strongest word for love in the Bible. It's not an emotional love. It's a committed love. It's the difference between dating and being married. Uh, agape means you're married. It means you're totally committed to the truth. And because they would not receive the love of the truth, so as to be saved, God gave them over to strong delusion. So let me go to the parable of the sower because the, our, hearts, the, our hearts are the part of us that either receives or rejects the word of God. God relates to our hearts. It's more important than our head. It's more important than any other part of our lives as it relates to our faith. And Jesus tells a story, the parable of the sower, about a sower that goes sowing the, the seed, which represents the word, on four different kinds of soil. And the four different kinds of soil represents four different conditions of our hearts, three of which keep us from receiving and bearing fruit for God by the word. But one of them is a good thing. We all want to have a good heart that receives the word of God. Here's Mark 4, the parable of the sower. And again, he began to teach by the sea and a great multitude was gathered to him. So he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea and the whole multitude was on the land facing the sea. Then he taught them many things by parables and he said to them in his teaching, listen, behold, a sower went out to sow and it happened as he sowed that some of the seed fell by the wayside and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on the stony ground where it did not have much earth and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. 
And some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased, and produced, some thirtyfold, some sixtyfold, and some a hundredfold. And he said to them, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And so the seed here is the word of God. He's going to interpret his own parable here in just a minute. We're going to look at the four different kinds of hearts. But the seed is the word of God and the ground, the four different kinds of ground represent four different kinds of hearts that either can or cannot receive the word of God. Let's begin with the first type of soil, which is the hard heart, the unbelieving heart. Mark 4, beginning with verse 14. The sower sows the word. This is Jesus' interpretation of the parable. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. And so I remember when I was hard hearted, I, I, I listened to the gospel. I listened to the word of God when I was growing up uh, from preachers and church and things like that. It just absolutely didn't faze me whatsoever. My heart was hard. And Satan is very, very threatened by the word of God. Notice here it says immediately Satan comes and steals the word away. Satan is so incredibly threatened by the word of God in all of our lives because the word of God defeats him. Here's Hebrews chapter 12. The word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the, to the division of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. The word of God is more powerful than any two-edged sword is more powerful than Satan himself. And before Satan defeats us, he has to disarm us. When he came into the Garden of Eden, his first words to humanity were, has God surely said. He had to get the word away from Adam and Eve so that he could defeat them. That's exactly the way it is with us. And when we're unbelieving, now there's two kinds of unbelief. There's global unbelief and there's selective unbelief. Global unbelief just means I don't believe. I don't even believe anything the Bible has to say. But selective unbelief says, well, I don't believe in giving. You know, I don't believe in forgiving. I don't believe in, you know, this. I don't believe in this. And we selectively, you know, reject the scriptures. And so this is talking about someone, I believe, who's just hard-hearted and rejects the Bible. The second type of heart is a shallow heart, a cowardly heart. This is Jesus, Mark 4, 16. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness and they have no root in themselves and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Now the word here for root, it means to have a firm hold. Like the deeper roots are, the harder it is to get a plant or a tree out of the ground. And so, but when they don't have much root, you just reach over and pick it up. These believers, they, they hear the word and they receive it with gladness. But then when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, in other words, when the word doesn't bless them, when the word costs them something, because they're not committed. When the word costs them something, they give up the word. You know, you see it all the time right now, the fear of man is that, you know, you want to be politically correct. You want to be re uh, received. And so you just say what other people want you to, to say and you compromise your faith in the process. Here's Mark 8. This is Jesus. When he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the son of man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his father with his holy angels. If that's not a wake up call, I don't know what is. If you want to save your life in, in this world, if you want all the likes, you know, on social media, if you want everybody to talk good about you, if you never want to be politically incorrect, you sold your soul. And Jesus said, if, if you want to save your life, you're going to lose your life. But if you'll give up your life, and what this means is, Jesus, I'll pay any price to follow you. He called his disciples and said, if anyone wants to follow after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And by the way, when Jesus said, take up your cross, he hadn't died on the cross yet. People didn't think of the cross. Well, we, we think of the cross. The cross meant a cruel death instrument. 
You have to take up your death instrument if you're going to be my disciple and you have to deny yourself. Well, that's exactly the opposite of the mantra of the world, which is think about yourself and do, you know, do what's good for you. And so we have to be willing to pay a price for the word of God. And we can't, we can't sacrifice uh, our faith on the altar of popularity or being liked by everybody. And Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, I'll be ashamed of you when I come in the glory of my Father with his holy angels. I don't want Jesus to be ashamed of me. In other words, you can think of it in the short term here in this life and be liked by everybody and compromise your faith and reject the word. Or you can think about it in the long term and realize one day you're going to see Jesus face to face. And that's going to be a good encounter or a bad encounter. And a lot of that depends on if you stood for the word of God in this life. The third type of, of soil or the third type of a heart is a thorny heart, a worldly heart. Mark 4. These are the ones that are sown among the thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things enter, entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. The word care there means anxious awareness. It means anxiety, stress. They hear the word, but it is choked out. There, there's not room enough for it to bear fruit because they're just too busy. There, here's the old saying, if the devil can't get in front of you and stop you, he'll get behind you and push you too fast. But either way, he wants, you to, he wants to keep you for bearing fruit for God. And what this is, is lack of priority. It means the Sabbath is not first. God is not first in my life. In other words, I worship God first, and then everything else comes after that. For these people, it's they go, they go, they go, they do, they do, they do. And if they have time for God, they have time for God. Now, they receive the word. They don't reject the word. They receive the word. But it's just choked out by busyness and stress and all those kinds of things. Here's 1 John 2. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come by which we know that it is the last hour. So John here is talking about the spirit of the Antichrist as he's talking about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life They're, that are not of the Father, but are of the world. And I want you to understand, there is God the Father who provides for us and leads us and guides us by his spirit. And we walk under the leadership and guidance and provision of the Father, or we go to the world. The world is a substitute for the Father. This is in Revelation where Mystery Babylon is judged. Mystery Babylon is the opposite of God the Father. It's the opposite of walking in the love of God and the peace of God and the provision of God. You instead went to the world. And by the way, in Revelation where Mystery Babylon is judged, it says, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and you receive her plagues. And that's a good message for today for Christians who are worldly and stressed out. Come out of her, my people. There's nothing wrong with the earth. There's nothing wrong with the, the world as it exists. In other words, a place to live in. But this is not our home. There's something wrong with the system that replaces God in our lives. And we have to prioritize God and prioritize the word of God. The fourth heart is a good heart. It's a believing heart, Mark 4. But these are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit, some 30-fold, some 60 and some a hundredfold. I want to have a good heart. I want to have a heart that I receive the word. I'm not hard hearted. I'm not shallow hearted. I don't have a thorny heart that I want to receive the word of God. And I want to bear fruit in my marriage in my family, in my life, in my ministry. And this, this is what Jesus was talking about. Okay. So I'm asking you a question because all of us, you know, I've, I've had times in my life when I was shallow. I've had times in my life where my heart was thorny. I didn't have time for the word of God. But what I, I think all of us can have times in our lives where any of those conditions exist. But the point is, the more we reject the word of God, either passively or actively, the more we're set up for deception. Let me read you one more scripture. This is in Mark 4. This is a part of the parable here. And this is chilling. This is Mark 4, beginning at verse 24. He said to them, take heed what you hear with the same measure you use. It will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. For whoever has to him, more will be given. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away. Now listen, he's talking about truth. He's talking about the word of God. And he says, to him who has truth, to him who receives my word, more will be given. But to him who rejects my truth, even the truth he has will be taken away. This, this is chilling. So here, here's the point. 
Every time I believe a scripture and every time I receive truth from God, I qualify myself for more truth. Every time I reject truth, I set myself up for deception. Okay, now next program, I'm talking about evolution. The very first chapter in the Bible, the very first part of the first chapter of the Bible talks about evolution that can't be taught in our public schools because it's not science, right? But science is evolution. I'll talk about the theory of evolution and I will debunk the theory of evolution on the show next time. Because listen, if you reject the first thing the Bible says is really bad. If you reject the first thing the Bible has to say, you're setting yourself up for deception in other areas. This is what's happening in Christianity today. Many people say, oh, well, the, you know, evolution, obviously, you know, that's, that's not true. That's not science. I'm telling you, there's more truth. There's more science on creationism than there is, there, there will ever be an evolution. And I'll prove it to you next week on this show. I'm saying we have to be people of the word of God to be able to stand for truth in an age of deception. And I just say to you right now, how do you receive the word of God? Is your heart a good heart? Is, is there something you need to do? Do you need to repent? Do you need to lose your life for the sake of Jesus? Do you need to cut back and stop? In other words, cut away some of the thorns that are robbing you of your relationship with God and your ability to worship and serve God. All of us have to do that at some point in our lives. And I'm encouraging you, if there's anything keeping you from the word of God Deal with it right now because Jesus is coming and we do not want to be ashamed of him and his words in this adulterous and sinful generation. We're going now to the subscriber part of the program. If you're not a subscriber to endtimes.com, it's $7 a month, $77 a year. We would love to have you be a subscriber.